Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, let's get started here. Let me just connect this one. Yep. This is an infographic I got from the uh, multi-platform trend report from the Cloud Foundry uh, website. Um, what's really interesting here for me is uh, if you look at the adoption of PaaS uh, uh, amongst the enterprises, you can see 77% of PaaS usage and 72% 72, 72 of containers, which is really interesting for me because if you compare uh, where PaaS, uh, how many years ago PaaS was there, and where containers came from, right? I mean, 72% is a big leap. And 46% uh, of serverless usage among enterprises, right? I mean, the people who have responded to this survey uh, are IT decision makers who are saying that 39% of, uh, 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 of the respondents are using all these three types of abstractions. So uh, what I want to talk to you uh, today is about Cloud Foundry, uh, originally started out as a pass, right? And now has abstractions which uh, uh, can run containers as well as serverless, right? So my question today to all of you is, uh, is it possible to architect an app spanning across the abstractions in Cloud Foundry? So when I say abstractions here, I mean pass, CAS, and FAS. So platform as a service, container as a service, and uh, uh, function as a service. So I'd like to start off with uh, a little bit of my experience, right? When I started in the uh, IT industry, there was only one way to develop an app, uh, and uh, it is a monolith, right? Every, every team member contributes to the same code base, and uh, we never used to call it a monolith in those days, right? I mean, there, was, uh, uh, there were lots of them happening, and uh, I just wanted to make an observation there that uh, when we started building these applications, the uh, focus amongst the developers, I mean, if you get into a development team, you can hear them talking about design patterns and uh, code complexity, basically because everyone is contributing to the same code base. So design patterns, I still have this book from uh, the Gang of Four. I'm sure some of you would uh, have read that as well. 20-plus uh, design patterns, some really cool object-oriented techniques uh, to use to have your code manageable, to get a shared understanding of the code base across the team, right? I mean, that's where the focus was, uh, and that's where the discussions were around. But uh, soon there were some uh, new architectural patterns that came out, like uh, uh, service-oriented architectures and then uh, microservices, where we started uh, basically taking that app and identifying the services Right, which make up that app and splitting them into different uh, uh, independently deployable uh, artifacts. Right? That's uh, where uh, the microservices world is heading. And then the focus changed from domain -driven, uh, into domain-driven design, DevOps, platforms, distributed computing. Right? I mean, what's, what's really interesting for me is coming from uh, uh, developing monoliths uh, during those years and now, Nobody is talking about design patterns, having a shared understanding, because everyone is working on a really small code base, and uh, all, they are carried, uh, all, they, all they are really uh, interested about is what interfaces do these services expose. They don't care about what the internal implementation of those services are. These are just observations I'd like to make. Then uh, uh, another observation I had was innovations in uh, cloud computing, uh, basically driven by the cloud vendors like Amazon, Google Cloud and uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, and also changes to the Linux kernel. I mean, innovations in the Linux kernel, the introduction of C groups, namespaces, and container technology in general has uh, actually given uh, rise to a, a different abstractions called PaaS, CAS, and FAS. So PaaS is a platform as a service, as you all know. It's, it's really uh, built for uh, running stateless apps. So when I say uh, stateless apps, what I really mean is apps which uh, have externalized their state. They don't do any kind of uh, persisting to disk or any of those uh, activities. And also 12-factor apps, it's a set of guidelines how to make your app uh, you know, deployable on such a platform as a service. Then you have uh, container as a service where it's, it's ideal for uh, running your commercial off-the-shelf uh, uh, products. 
stateful apps. For example, a stateful app would be if you're running some uh, machine learning workloads. And uh, if it is Apache Spark, for example, it does most of its compute in memory. But when uh, there is no, uh, no much memory left, it has to spill to disk and write to disk. Such kinds of applications can run, and it's well suited for a container as a service. Right? Even databases, as you can see, many of the database vendors now containerizing their applications and giving it out uh, for use. Then you have uh, function as a service, right? These are basically, uh, you just push your function to the platform, and the platform takes care of uh, running the function for you. I mean, basically give it a URL, maybe a Git uh, URL, and it will take that URL, build the image for you, and when an event comes into the uh, platform, it spins up uh, the container or whatever technology it's using and to service that uh, event. So. What, uh, why I wanted to uh, set this up here is because I wanted to just uh, show that we have got the choice of now moving these uh, uh, services into these uh, different abstractions, right? So uh, my question today is, I mean, how does Cloud Foundry really help you uh, 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 basically sprangle a monolith into microservices and then there are services within these, uh, those boxes which are a good fit. Some of them are a good fit for a platform as a service, some of them are a good fit for a, a container as a service, and some for uh, even driven functions. So uh, the next question I have is, so what does Cloud Foundry offer for a multi-platform world? Right? I mean, how can you use uh, Cloud Foundry to uh, run such workloads on di with different abstractions? So this is what uh, I was showing you earlier. So Cloud Foundry has uh, something called as an application runtime, the CFAR, which is, uh, which is basically a mission statement. You can call it like uh, the ONC's uh, haiku, which says, here's my source code. Run it on the cloud for me. I don't care how. Right? You just do a CF push, and the application, the, uh, uh, the runtime takes care of building the uh, container for you. Uh, storing the container in a registry within the platform, uh, doing your DNS, networking, security, and all that stuff is, even the load balancing is taken care for you. So uh, you as a developer don't have to do anything about it. Then you have the uh, Cloud Foundry container runtime, which was previously called uh, Kubo, which means Kubernetes on Bosch. So it, it, it gives you uh, an interface for you to create highly available Kubernetes clusters managed by Bosch. Right? So on these two building blocks, you can actually uh, have all your abstractions running. So that's the, uh, that's the focus of my talk today, of uh, uh, taking a demo app and sh showing how you can place uh, the services which are well-suited for running on a PaaS, CAS, and a FAS. Right? So that makes it multi-platform. Uh, and Bosch, uh, if you're not aware, Bosch is a release engineering, deployment management, and uh, a lifecycle management tool which uh, has, a, has a component called uh, CPI, uh, which stands for Cloud Provider Interface, all right? And that makes it cloud agnostic. So uh, uh, you could be running your PaaS on the uh, application runtime on Bosch, and Bosch might be uh, deploying it onto AWS, for example, or it could be VMware vSphere, right? Bosch abstracts out the, uh, uh, what do you call, the complexity of dealing with each cloud provider so that the operator doesn't have to deal with it himself. So it provides a good control plane for the operator to uh, work with the platform. And that makes it uh, multi-cloud, right? So you get a multi-cloud plus a multi-platform uh, with Cloud Foundry. So uh, this is the app uh, we're going to have a look at today, right? Uh, uh, what, the, what the app does is it has a few APIs and uh, a UI, as you can see, which is deployed into a platform as a service. So given a website uh, URL, uh, the app is going to go fetch all the links uh, from this website and then make a prediction as to what kind of uh, website uh, this is from a predefined list of categories. So I'll do a quick uh, uh, recorded uh, demo of this. So since we are in Basel, I thought I'll do uh, basel.com, which is a tourism uh, website, uh, and let's see how it goes. So this is a recorded uh, uh, video for you. We'll get into the details of what exactly is happening behind the scenes 
and how this app has been uh, uh, deployed onto different abstractions. So, so the link has been submitted. What it's doing in the background, it's going and fetching all the links to uh, the site basil.com. So you can see the words. I mean, it does uh, a little bit of uh, stemming and uh, uh, before it submits it to the uh, machine learning uh, uh, module. So the fetching of links is happening on uh, uh, function as a service. Uh, we'll look into that soon. Uh, the machine learning the prediction is done on container as a service, and the API and the UI is hosted on uh, the platform as a service. Right. Let me just forward this a little bit. So it just predicted it as uh, a travel website, which is uh, pretty much right. So let's move on. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, you to this team, right, uh, which is uh, called the WebCat team. So there are UX and uh, API designers here. Uh, the UI designers are run, uh, building their front ends. Uh, the API developers are uh, using Spring Boot, Node.js. They need a Postgres or Redis cache. Uh, they use uh, a platform as a service. Uh, which is a, which, so that they can go in and do a self-service kind of uh, provisioning of their uh, uh, of their applications and their backends. Then we have the data science team, uh, right? With data scientists doing the uh, machine learning uh, work, they are doing their data science models uh, for this uh, prediction of the category of the website. Then you have the uh, data engineering guys on this side uh, who are responsible for uh, ingesting data into the uh, into their environment, right? And also building the data pipelines here. So this is uh, how the uh, stack looks up, uh, uh, looks. The UI and APIs are using uh, Spring Boot and Node.js. Um, they're using their own uh, Postgres and Redis. And that's running on the uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime, right? And the machine learning team is using Spark, which is running on the Cloud Foundry container runtime. And we'll talk about uh, the serverless and the event-driven functions. It's using Riff plus Knative. Uh, and all this is uh, running on Bosch, as I talk, uh, mentioned earlier. Just uh, so that I can set the context here, I'm using a vSphere environment uh, with uh, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry installed. Uh, uh, as you can see, I have a Bosch director uh, there and the pivotal application service and the pivotal container service. So the application service is uh, uh, running on top of uh, it's basically uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime, and the uh, container service, pivotal container service, is uh, using the Cloud Foundry uh, container runtime. So uh, let's uh, do the uh, deploying of the front end. API is onto the application runtime. So I'll have to uh, log into my VPN to do that, so just bear with me. Once that's connected, we should be able to push an app. Yep, looks like it is connected now. Okay. Uh, yep. So the first step is I have this app here, which is just a Spring Boot app, which I'll be pushing it onto the platform, onto the Pivotal application service, which is uh, running on the Cloud Foundry uh, application runtime. Right. So I'll just show you where. It's running CF target will show me that uh, I'm targeting the api.system.pcfplatform.com. That's where uh, the platform's running. So I'm going to do a CF push. So this is the, uh, here's my source code. Uh, run it on the cloud for me. I don't care how. Happening uh, live. I've just pushed an app 
uh, which has a manifest which is just uh, describing that the name is webcat. That's the uh, uh, jar you need to deploy and the name of the app as well. Once, as you can see, uh, I've just pushed an app and it's the build pack detection and uh, creating a container or a droplet is taken care of by the platform. And uh, even storing that into a registry, is, uh, it's done uh, by the platform itself. Now, this is the route for that app. I'm going to hit that. This is the uh, apps manager, uh, which would be showing me the app here. So this is just deployed. I can click on it. And if everything works, uh, I should be able to see uh, the UI. So. Uh, that's the first part of deploying the application. Now let's look at the second part of deploying the uh, machine learning workloads, right? So this is done. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, deploying the machine learning workloads. So the first step is to create a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, using uh, PK as the command line tool. So I'll uh, speak briefly about uh, uh, the PKS tool. So so I'm logging into uh, the environment. Yep. Okay. So when, uh, so PKS is a command line tool for you to spin up uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters, highly available Kubernetes clusters. So what I've uh, done here is it takes 10 to 15 minutes to spin up a cluster, so I've done it in advance. Uh, what it's doing is as an operator, you can go in and say PKS create a cluster, and uh, the PKS API will talk to Bosch, and then use the CF uh, uh, container runtime to create a highly available Kubernetes cluster for you. So once uh, this command uh, finishes, you have a highly available Kubernetes cluster, right? So that's what I've done already. The next step is for me to get the credentials for the cluster into my uh, kubeconfig. Then finally, I deploy the machine learning workloads, right? I've done all this uh, here. You can. CTL. So you can see there are a few uh, namespaces here. Uh, you can see there's one called machine learning workloads where I have deployed my uh, pod. Right, that's where the Spark uh, application is running right now. And if I look at my default namespace, there's nothing running at the moment. Oh, there is a link collector. Probably it'll die in some time. Okay, so uh, deploying machine learning workloads with Spark uh, 2.3, there has been native support for running uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so you can now uh, actually run Kubernetes on the, uh, 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 sorry, run Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, final part is to run the function as a service. Before we get into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the landscape, right? You have uh, AWS Lambda, Azure Functions and Google Cloud Functions, which are uh, function as a service provided by these vendors. You also have uh, the open source uh, function as a service. Now, all these open source implementation have a build, scale, and eventing module. But the thing is, they have uh, a slightly bit uh, different implementation of this, which has created a lot of fragmentation and lock-in. So what uh, uh, a new initiative called Knative, which was started by Google with uh, industry leaders. Uh, what it has done is it's a Kubernetes-based platform to build, deploy, and manage your modern serverless workloads. So it has the same serving, build, and eventing. Serving is basically scaled to zero. Build is uh, given your uh, source code. It, uh, it does source to image. Events is how do you uh, manage subscriptions and delivery of events to these functions. Right, so we'll be using Riff. It's an open source project from Pivotal. Uh, it stands for Riff is for functions. That's the uh, uh, URL if you're interested. Go have a look, please. Uh, it builds upon Knative and is going to be the foundation for our future product called Pivotal Function Service. 
Right? Now, let's get into deploying these event-driven functions. So Riff, as I mentioned, uses Knative uh, under, the, uh, under the hood. So when you do a Riff system install uh, manifest table, it goes and installs uh, Knative for you under the hood. So the first step for me is to uh, create a channel. Right? I create a channel here with the link collector. So what it's basically doing is I'm creating two uh, channels. These are uh, uh, Knative concepts. But since I'm using a Kafka bus here, it's going and creating uh, an actual Kafka topic under the hood. Right? So once I create these two channels, I'm going to have my function code deployed. So I'm saying uh, riff service create a link collector. And I'm uh, saying that's the image you need to use when you start uh, uh, building the, uh, uh, when there's an event, you need to start up this container. Now, the last step is connecting the dots, right? I mean, how you do a subscribe, a RIF service subscribe, and say that, okay, link collector is my uh, input, and whatever the uh, cat's link collector service returns has to go into a different uh, uh, channel. Now, RIF hides all the complexity of the YAMLs and all those things which you need to create and uh, makes it really simple for you to uh, build this pipeline. Now, so this is the uh, RIF uh, command line. So if I do a RIF channel list, you can see uh, some of the uh, channels which I have created. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, to show you the pipeline I've built. So I'll just explain what exactly this is doing. Initially, when I go and submit a link, uh, a link goes into the link collector, which is picked up by the cat's link collector service, and it goes and says, okay, basil.com has 138 links, the, the link fanout channel, and it puts those 138 individual links into the link fanout channel. The link fanout channel picks it up and puts it into the link crawler channel, which, in, which starts going and crawling these sites individually, uh, uh, the URLs individually. And finally, the cat's link crawler is putting that data into the link crawled channel. Basically, these are all going into a Kafka topic, right? Uh, the machine learning module will, uh, then there's another function which gets info which picks up all this data and sends it to the machine learning module and says, based on this data we have collected about this uh, website, what do you think is the category which it belongs to? So, so this is the high-level architecture of uh, the app, right? You, as a user, you come in and submit a link to the web app, which posts it into a queue. Now, the queue can be managed either as part of a uh, platform as a service, because we have integrations with Service Broker and the Open Service Broker API. It could be managed there, or it could be something running in your uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, system as well. Whatever it is, uh, those messages are picked up by the function as a service. So each of them starts executing it. And finally, uh, the data goes into the machine learning app on this side, and finally, uh, a prediction is made, and that response comes into queue, picked up by the web app, and shown to the uh, end user. So the, basically, you can see how you can place components which make sense uh, for a particular abstraction in their own uh, in their own uh, space. Right. So normally, you shouldn't see anything running here uh, when you post uh, a link. That's when uh, something should appear here. So maybe I've kicked off something just before uh, the uh, presentation. That's why it's running. So uh, with Knative, what happens is uh, when, uh, when there is no activity for a particular queue, the uh, container is uh, terminated, right? So if I just watch these uh, pods now, Normally, you wouldn't see this uh, cat's link collector here, but anyway, let's do just let's go and kick off a new web page. I mean, a new URL to uh, and then I'll switch to the uh, console view so that you can see the uh, event driven functions starting up uh, in response to the event. So you can see that the uh, 
link collector is already there. So it has started up, and you can see the link fan out starting, and then the link crawler initializing and then starting up. Right? So these are the event-driven functions which are happening in the background. They are going to crawl, and you can see those uh, responses coming in uh, in some time for all these uh, links. Right? So you can see that there are three, uh, three containers in each pod. So there is an Istio proxy, there is also a queue proxy, and your actual user container. That's the business logic uh, for your container there. Right? So Fortunately, this is not a recording, so I can't fast forward this, so it's going to take some time. So it's predicted it as a computer and internet-related site uh, based on the uh, uh, crawled content. OK. Uh, so this is the high-level architecture, as I mentioned. And finally, uh, I'd like to just summarize uh, what I uh, was just talking about. So the initial question, is it possible to architect an app across these abstractions? Cloud Foundry, I think uh, it is. I just uh, showed you a demo of that. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is choose the right abstractions for the job. Uh, most of the time, I, when we uh, you know, go to customers, we see uh, you know, there, are, there are apps like APIs, which need uh, uh, RDBMS or uh, uh, cache. Just use platform as a service. That's the right abstraction for running such workloads. Run. Uh, workloads which need persistence and a lot of networking requirements on container as a service, and even driven um, uh, apps which need, which have these even driven uh, kind of uh, patterns, run it on a function as a service. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, end this talk. Thank you for your time.